We're all set. Good evening. This is the March 21st, 2019 meeting of the Monroe Planning and Zoning Commission. Uh, meeting in Town Council Chambers. It's now 7.02 p.m. Please stand and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, Indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Commission, please introduce yourself, starting on my right. Brian Condon, alternate. Kenneth Wilk, alternate. Bruno Maini, commissioner. Leanna Brody, commissioner. William Porter, chairman. Paul Lisi, secretary. Michael Riley, vice chairman. Will Agresta, planning and zoning administrator. Rick Schultz, town planner. Thank you. Item number three, organizational and administrative matters. We have none. Item four, general public participation. Is there anyone who would like to address the commission on an issue that's not related to an open application or a public hearing? Seeing none. Item five, general appointments. We have none. Public hearings. Okay, instructions for a public hearing. There are two sets of microphones for both public address and recording of the proceedings. Due to the need for recording, it is important to stand at the microphone at all times and speak into it loudly and clearly in order that everyone in the room can hear and capture what is being said. Individuals speaking from the seats will not be heard and will not be recognized to speak. Order of the hearing of an application. Points of order and responses will be entertained. Exhibits will be read for the record. Applicant and or representatives will present the application and will answer commission questions. The floor will be open to those in favor. The floor will be open to those opposed. The floor will be open to general comments or questions. The floor will be open to the applicant who may take the opportunity for closing remarks or rebuttal after which discussion will close. The applicant or his representatives are the final speakers. No comments shall be accepted from anyone unless recognized by the chair. All questions and comments shall be addressed to the chair who will determine if an answer shall be provided and by whom. There shall be absolutely no discussion between speakers and audience. The commission has no intention to limit the right of any person to speak, but asks that speakers try not to be repetitive. Please try to present new information. If something has been said before, the Commission would invite you to indicate your agreement with previous speakers. At no time shall there be displays of emotion such as applause, cheering, shouting, or similar noise. This is critical as this hearing is being recorded. If this happens, you will be cautioned. A vote or demonstration by a show of hands, standing by the audience, or similar action will not be recognized. All parties are requested not to talk between themselves while the hearing is in progress. If you feel a need to talk, please step out into the lobby. All speakers, when recognized, must advance to the microphone to speak. Please state your name and address for the record. The chairman reserves the right to cut off discussion if it is not relevant to the application or is presented in an inappropriate manner. This is a legal proceeding, much the same as what would occur in a courtroom setting. We request that all parties observe the proper decorum that would be observed in that setting. Please turn off all cell phones or similar devices. If you have a need to use these devices, please leave the room and use them outside. Okay, item six on our agenda is, is a public hearing, ZCA 2018-02, a zone boundary change for 575 Monroe Turnpike. Uh, that has been postponed to the April 4th meeting at the request of the applicant. Item number seven, SCP 2018-12, file number 1607A, 575 Monroe Turnpike, special exception permit application to permit a child daycare center. Uh, that has also been adjourned to April 4th at the request of the applicant. Item number eight. Um, In accordance with Connecticut General Statute, Section 8-7D, a public hearing will be held in the Town Hall Council Chambers, 7 Fan Hill Road, Monroe, Connecticut, 
on Thursday, March 21st, 2019 at 7 p.m. or soon thereafter concerning the following. SUB 2019-01, file number 1264C, 104 Elm Street, Residential and Farming District 1. Three subdivision application proposing a three lot detached single family residential subdivision. CT Houses LLC, uh, CEO Paul Da, member, owner, applicant. Will we have four exhibits? Exhibit one, subdivision application materials. Exhibit two, plan set. Exhibit three, Kimlin Wetlands Commission subdivision report recommendations. Exhibit four, watershed protection notification form. Exhibit five, notice to Aquarium Water Company. Exhibit six, ART engineer comments. Exhibit seven, planning and zoning ART comments. Exhibit eight, a butters list with certified mail receipts. And exhibit nine, uh, green cards from a buddy mail. And that is all. For the applicant. Good evening, members of the Commission. My name is David Bjorklund. I'm president of the firm SPAP Bjorklund Associates, and we have offices here in Monroe. I'm a professional engineer registered in the state of Connecticut. This application this evening, I'm representing uh, CT Homes, uh, whose principal is uh, Mr. Paul Dew, who is the owner of the property. Uh, the site contains 6.4 acres. Uh, has 585 foot of frontage on Elm Street. Uh, this uh, site is on the east side, just north of the intersection of Purdy Hill Road uh, and Elm Street. Uh, the property is bounded on the rear. Uh, it's the wetland area network here on the rear of the property is uh, a pond and uh, the Farm Mill River. Uh, the property was subject uh, to a taking in the past. Uh, in 1980, the state of Connecticut uh, had a reconstruction project of Elm Street from uh, Route 111 to just south of this site. Uh, and as a result of that, there was a taking uh, that took place along the front of the property, uh, which resulted, uh, the primary note, the thing that differed was this barn at one point in time had been much larger. The proposal is to subdivide the property into three lots. Uh, lot number one and two are to be uh, lots created for new dwellings. Uh, lot three uh, has an ex a large uh, colonial style house on it. Uh, and I believe that house goes back to either the 17th or definitely the 18th century. Yeah. The inland wetlands approval has been provided for the site see the red line is the 100 foot uh, setback from the edge of the wetlands uh, and the uh, so this is the the regulated upland area in here the there were there was really only one issue with the wetlands commission and uh, back here uh, on the property uh, there was a pile of fill that was placed there uh, its origins are unknown but this happened back between 1984 and 1990, as best we can determine. Uh, it has trees growing in it that are 30 years old, at least in my estimation. Uh, the problem was, was that this fill, not only being within uh, the wetland setback, was in a floodplain. So after a lot of negotiations with the Wetlands Commission, we came to the conclusion that we would excavate this area here down to about three to four feet, and that would provide for the storage that had been stolen by the placement of this pile in, in the floodplain. We had then proposed to the Wetlands Commission that we truck the, the off-site, uh, there's a, an old driveway here, uh, they felt that that would have uh, too much of an impact on the regulated <coughs> upland areas, uh, and so we struck, came to an alternative plan that uh, allowed us to keep the fill here, uh, and uh, but still not losing any flood storage capacity. Uh, other than that, uh, there is public water in uh, in Elm Street, uh, and that 
will serve the dwellings. Uh, public water does not currently go to the existing home here. The well will be abandoned and it will be connected to public water. Uh, on lots one and two, uh, we indicate possible development plans uh, for the, the development. Uh, as the commission knows, these are uh, just proposals that prove that development of these two lots is uh, possible and feasible under the current uh, town subdivision regulation zoning and uh, health department regulations. Uh, the soils on the site are quite good, uh, and, uh, but the ultimate development plans for the two lots uh, will be subject, uh, if they do change, to go back to the Wetlands Commission. And then individual site plans for each one of the building lots uh, will be obtained at the time uh, that we get a building permit. Uh, I'll be glad to answer any questions in general uh, about the proposal. If not, I'll, uh, I'll move on to the staff comments. Let me go through the staff comments first. It might eliminate a bunch of questions. Okay. Uh, starting off with the town engineer's comments, uh, the, uh, in, under his administration, uh, general administrative comments, uh, number two, uh, Scott indicates uh, several items that are to be bond, bonded. Uh, most of these items are not proposed to be public improvements, and it's my understanding that with the subdivision that the only thing that can be bonded is the erosion control and the actual public improvements. Uh, in the case of this subdivision, I think the public improvements are going to be limited to uh, the relocation of this, <coughs> this guardrail, uh, which currently exists in front of the property. Uh, the uh, general and technical comments, uh, these are mostly the survey items, and they will be provided. Uh, there is an existing asphalt apron, and both uh, planning and engineering uh, requested that this be removed. Uh, our client doesn't want to remove it. Uh, this, is an, uh, this, this apron was constructed uh, in the state of Connecticut improvements of, of Elm Street. There is, and has been for a long time, a gravel driveway that runs down this side of the property. As you can see, this is a, going to be a large piece of property. There is a lot of area in the back of the lot that can be utilized. Uh, the existing driveway that comes into the site, you cannot gain access to the property here uh, because there's a retaining wall located here. So the only way somebody could get to the acreage back here uh, in a vehicle or a tractor would have to be to come across the front lawn and then across the yard and down. As I said, this property traditionally has always used uh, this driveway, and for that reason, we'd like to keep that asphalt apron there. Uh, the uh, next comment, C1, has to do with the regrading of the shoulders of Elm Street to meet uh, the subdivision requirements. Uh, it's our opinion that, as I said, uh, the road was reconstructed to state standards in 1980, and the town accepted the road after the construction was complete. Uh, in our opinion, our client should not be responsible. I think the, for the, the shoulder in this area here probably does not meet current requirements, but the road has, was rebuilt and was accepted uh, by the town. Uh, traffic and safety, we plan on resetting the guardrail is located in this area here that was part of the road reconstruction plan. Uh, we're going to relocate that uh, back to almost to the property line. Uh, we have to do that to achieve sight distance from these driveways here. Uh, and what we want to do is we want to grade into the lot here only at a two to one slope, not, we would have to grade at a four to one slope to eliminate the guardrail, which was suggested. The four to one slope basically goes about halfway to the house. And if you go by the piece of property, there, it's, there's a lot of trees right here in front of the lot. 
If you know Elm Street, this is a busy road, it carries a lot of traffic, both in the morning and in the afternoon. And we like to keep the guardrail only grade away at the two to one slope. And that way we can keep some trees in the front yard to provide some more buffering to the site. The sight line, uh, Scott had several comments on this. Uh, the, one of the concerns was this property to the north here, uh, which the sight line does cross. The sight line profiles are detailed. <coughs> uh, was it if the grass grew in this area? Uh, we don't think that that is, is going to become an issue and we can get into, we can discuss this further with Scott. Uh, first off, there's a gravel driveway here uh, that is used intermittently and it provides a circular driveway to the house. The main asphalt driveway is over here, <coughs> but uh, it, I, I had the advantage of, this, is, this has been where I've lived for the last uh, 67 years. Uh, I live right around the corner, and uh, this yard, since this house was built, uh, the front shoulder has always been mowed, uh, and I don't think that the sight line from this driveway across the shoulder there is going to be an issue. But as I said, if the commission wants me to take that up in, in detail the, uh, with Scott, I'll be happy to. Scott had requested that another SNET pole be set in this area here. There is a pole right here. What we're proposing to do is have the drop down to lot one there and then run down the shoulder with the underground and into the house on lot two. I think that's something that we ought to leave up to the utility companies if they want to set another, another pole. Uh, that's going to be their call, and we, we really have no say over that if they want another pole. Uh, the erosion and sediment control comments, uh, we have no comments. Uh, the, uh, Scott had requested street trees, uh, as noted in uh, 111.310A. Uh, if you reference that section of the subdivision regulations, uh, it says, and I'm paraphrasing, street trees are to be planted on any street that's to be dedicated to the town. Uh, I take that to mean that if you're creating a new subdivision road uh, that you're building from scratch and then you're going to dedicate it to the town, uh, then, then you will include street trees in the plan. As I said... Uh, Are you at, taking any trees down along the street? There's going to be some scrub taken down. You know, not, not okay, you don't document that. Unless if you document that, that would maybe support what you just said? Okay, we can... Yeah. On Scott's items, H, I, and J, we have no comments. Uh, planning uh, comments one, uh, those are housekeeping items. One and two are housekeeping items. I don't see any, any issues there. With regards to the subdivision map, uh, we had a pre-planning meeting uh, to discuss, or pre-design meeting with development uh, in general. And uh, one of the comments was uh, the, uh, indicate the open space that we're proposing to grant to the town. And it was determined at that point in time that the uh, open space, this is only a six acre parcel, 10% would be less than an acre. Uh, and behind, uh, our, to the east, this is a private residence, this is a private residence, this is private property. We're surrounded by private property. This is an existing single. These are all existing single family houses. So they're really, if we did dedicate, if there were adjacent open space, it would be a great place to do an open space dedication. Um, but when this property was subdivided to the south, um, you know, back in the 60s, uh, there, was, there was no, no proposal made for open space. So it's, again, it's, it's our opinion that open space uh, isn't practical and just and nor desirable on this piece of property. Okay, you're still going to address the requirements. The requirements require it. 
or you have to convince the commission to do something in the alternative. So you have to look into the standards and provide the alternative to convince the commission. Another common comment from uh, Mr. Gresta is there is a log cabin on the property uh, that's located right here. Uh, it's been there as long as I can remember. Uh, <coughs> I would say probably 20 years ago, maybe more, uh, it, it was fixed up. Uh, it's our intention to leave it on the property, uh, make a great utility shed, make a great uh, you know, clubhouse for, for the kids, but it's our intention to leave that up to the next property owner. I don't have a problem with it being there. It says you had to document what's inside because log cabin, I don't know if it has a kitchen in it or anything like that because it can't be a second dwelling. Okay. There is indicated on our plan, see it right here, there is a possible encroachment of a septic system uh, from this piece of property here. Uh, this is based upon records in the health department, which are not particularly accurate. Uh, this is our best fit of the information uh, in that it might be, it might straddle this property line here. Uh, this. Uh, this is one of these things it could be, maybe it's not. Uh, you don't usually go looking for those kinds of things because if we did damage to the individual septic system, uh, there would be liability associated with it. Uh, I see it as a, uh, I, did, I didn't notice any, any comments from the, uh, the health department with regards to it. And uh, I see this as a, a possible encroachment that may have to be addressed sometime in the future if that septic system were ever to fail. There are fence and retaining walls. Are you accepting the encroachment? Pardon? Are you accepting the encroachment? It's, it's there. It's not a matter of acceptance. Well, it could be a, a legal encroachment that the property owner could challenge. That could be. I don't, could be I, don't, I don't think that's a, a subdivision issue. It could be challenged today. It could be <coughs> well, we're creating a lot with the encroachment, so it is. Well, uh, the encroachment is there on the same piece of property. Well, the way to clean it up is either work it out, get an easement, or get rid of it. Easements are not permitted under the health code. Well, either would it, it be could, it, lot. I don't, legally, it may, it may be an adverse. I, I think it's a legal question. It's, the, uh, it's there. You know, it's the same, you know, we could compare it, it's the same way as down here. Uh, we have a small the, uh, chain link fence runs up this property line and then cuts across. Uh, that has been there from my opinion, looking at it, it's been there for years. We own the fence to the property line and then the fence continues on. It's the same way with there's a stone retaining wall, uh, which was built over the property line. Yeah, yeah, until recently, that property and the property next were owned by the same person. They probably didn't care because they used them interchangeably and they had accessory uses on that lot that shouldn't have been there. Um, it's only now that they're separate on it. That's a very recent occurrence. Well, but the, I mean, the property line has been there. And so the way I see it is this individual owns most of the wall, most of it's on his property. And the small amount that is on this property is on this property. If the, if the owner of lot three wants to remove it to the property line, he can't. Okay. I, see, I see it. It's the same way with the fence. If he wants to remove the fence to the property line, when he takes ownership, it's his fence. Again, I think these are more legal questions. Than Uh, the setbacks for the existing house uh, it was requested they be shown on the site plan. They are shown on the subdivision map. Yeah. 
the uh, existing street standards. Uh, again, this gets down to this is this is an existing town road uh, that was rebuilt as a part of a state of Connecticut project. Uh, the, the right of way is there; it's 60 feet wide. Uh, it's our contention that it's adequate as far as it, you address an existing street. Uh, there's also um, in that section of the regulations, uh, you're to address drainage. Again, this was all new drainage installed in 1980. And for the most part, this entire piece of property, except for a small area in the front, drains to the road. The remainder of the property all drains to the rear. So there are no, there are no impacts on the existing. Dave, the, the problem is your, your application materials don't really document what you just said. So we need to document those things and not address those issues? Oh, I think the topographic map. Well, you don't show the entire right of way, so we don't really know it is 60 feet. You don't really talk about no, the construction related to the right of way is shown on the subdivision map. No, it's not. Yes, it is. Okay. I, I, okay. That's, I looked at it this afternoon. And as far as the, the next part of the existing street standards are that uh, the commission can ask for if the road is inadequate that the road be reconstructed or portions of the road be reconstructed and it's our contention that the road was reconstructed uh, to standards that exceed uh, a lot of the current town standards uh, back in 80 and that elm street is more than adequate for carrying the traffic that it's designed for and the traffic that's that's generated in the area uh, the water does span the frontage. That's something that we only show the water line. To here, we'll show the rest of the water line and show it being connected to the house. The, uh, uh, again, the, the same comment was made on the asphalt apron. We'd like to keep that. Uh, we will provide the computations for the front yard encroachment. They're, go they're going to be minor. We have not required, uh, provided a drainage report, uh, again, because uh, we are not impacting the town's drainage system and we're not building any new drainage with the exception of these two lots here. Uh, we are providing for uh, <coughs> stormwater retention from the homes when they are built. We have preliminary comp computations. They're shown on uh, detail sheet one. Uh, those will most likely be modified when we do the detailed site development plans for the individual lots at the time of the building permit. Uh, there was, was a note from Mr. Agresta with regards to which would apply to the work that's being done down here <coughs> that was uh, required uh, in our inland wetlands approval because of this fill pile that encroaches into the floodplain. Uh, this is a minor amount of fill uh, that is, is being generated here. Uh, and we're, as I said, we're digging a shallow basin here and we're depositing the material here. It constitutes about 365 yards. Looking at the excavation uh, regulations, uh, I, I, I don't think it makes sense to go through that entire regulation and file another application uh, just to do this work, which is a benefit to the floodplain. Uh, in the very end of that regulation, uh, there is a provision that if uh, we request it in writing that the commission can evaluate the situation and waive uh, the requirement. Uh, so what I'm going to do is uh, submit a letter to the commission uh, requesting uh, that the, that uh, be waived. Uh, the last and final is that there was a request to provide uh, sight line information and other information on this driveway here for the existing house. It's the same driveway that has been there since 1980 and uh, the driveway uh, regulations exempt that driveway uh, from the driveway regulations. So. Is it exempted? Pardon? Has it exempted? It, if the driveway existed before the adoption of the driveway regulations, it's exempt. So when you modify it, it's 
it's exempt. The modification is exempt. Pardon? When you modify it, it's exempt. Well, we're not modifying it. The drive we're eliminating the a good portion of it. Right? The throat of the driveway where it intersects Elm Street, we're leaving it exactly the same. We're eliminating this paved area here, <coughs> but that throat where you, where you come in and out, that's remaining the same. I'll review that. I mean, there, if you'll go out there and look at it, there is a curb here. You know, the throat of the entry is there. That concludes my presentation. I'll be glad to answer any questions. Before you move on to that, you should look at the waiver section for the excavation permit. That waiver is for application um, permit standards. I'm not sure it's for the permit itself. I didn't. Because there's an exemption section which talks about what's exempt from that. So I read both sections, I thought this one fit better if you think there's... Is this for the commission? Yes. Do you have copies? Pardon? Do you have copies? I have a copy. I, I was assuming this hearing was going to proceed okay. as other hearings have. I mean, I can go make copies right now if you want me to. If, if you think there's another part of the regulations, the exemption part. It's the request for waiver on that part. I don't make copies of okay. um, Or we can make it later. I mean, I, yeah, I don't it's not going to affect tonight. At the moment. Yeah, I had assumed that we were going to discuss the staff reports tonight yeah. and get back yeah. at the next year. Yeah, there's a couple of, there's a couple of things we're going to have. You're going to have to consider and get back to us on. So, Ryan. Yeah, um, no questions at this time. Right. No, questions. no questions at this time. The only question I have is about the, you were talking about the encroachment of the septic system on the lot. How do you think I, I, I think it's a legal thing. I think, it, it, it's, I think it's a legal issue, not a subdivision issue. Yet. I think possibly the commission ought to consult with your land use attorney. Uh, it's been there for years. Uh, I, I don't know if I've never seen an adverse possession for something that is underground but it's also something that I personally don't want to go look for because I could destroy the system as I... Could you just explain that a little more to me? So there might be a leaching field of the neighbors underneath this well, lot, lot, right? Right. I don't understand what... I don't see anything on this. Yeah. Well, if you, if you look on the site plan, you'll notice right here on the edge. <coughs> And here, let me, let me explain the process to the commission. When, and this was a system that was more prevalent 10 to 30 years ago. When a septic system was installed, the, the installer would actually go do what we would call an installer's as-built. And he would take his tape and he would measure off the corners of the house. And they would do it to the nearest foot uh, they would do it climbing over piles of dirt, around pieces of equipment. They're not noted for their accuracy. These are not survey documents. Now most septic as builds, unless they're in perfect soils, are done by a surveyor. So that you, you have an accurate location. So this is, we took the information from the health department. This was our best fit. <laughs> Have I seen these be off by 10, 20 feet? Yes. So the as-built indicates that it's on what? That what? On that, that, it, that it comes over the property line. Beaching fields? That's, yes. How far over? Is it on this map?
if the according to as how we have plotted it, which as I've said is our best fit of the information, is five feet. Well, well why don't you just um, give Ben a call and just ask him if there's sure. any, anything that we should be concerned about. Okay. Anything else? Here? No, that's a good call. Uh, just for clarification, I think this area is zoned, is it one acre zone? Yeah. Okay. Yes. And, and the smaller lots being created, those are one acre? Yes. Okay. That's it. Yeah, we have, we have six, six, acres point, six acres and we're only creating the, uh, there, there, spatially there is another lot here, but we would have to tear down the old home. Right. The apron um, is already there, right? The apron, the southern driveway or yes. trail apron. That, that area there, it was, in my opinion, that was in call, installed by the state, of Connecticut, or the state of Connecticut. Plans called for that to be installed, and the contractor installed it, recognizing that there was a driveway here. This property, the rear of this property, uh, was it was owned and utilized uh, by a local nursery grower and so there was nursery stock that was grown back here and this was the access in and out and to this day whether we subdivide two lots off on the north side it's still in my opinion going to be the primary way to get to the rear of the property. Um, do you know why Scott wanted that removed? Or? Um, well I suggested it to you only because it's like encouraging use to go to where but you know it, it could be a potential use to the back because they do have the upper areas not really accessible down to the lower area look through the grass it's a gravel driveway crush them do you think it should be removed well when they were going to finish with the the work in the back with the wetlands and stuff there didn't seem much of the need for it to go back there and it's part of the, the wetland protection and all that i mean it's again there is a there is a they said a good portion of the backyard that could be accessed via that without having to go through the front of the house. Okay. Utility company usually takes care of the poles. Is why you didn't well, I that. think we should understand what's going on with that because it also affects sight lines for the driveway. And the utility doesn't have car plumbing. Does it it's adversely? the town's right away. It's not, not the utility's right away. It adversely affects the sight line from the driveway? I, I don't know. That was Scott's comment about the poles. No, I, I think, and I. When I read Scott's comment, rather than run the new power lines in the shoulder of the road and then across to the lot, if a new pole was installed here, the drop down to the underground could be located right there and go right to the lot. I don't know why. It would seem to me that Scott was trying to avoid having the utilities installed in the shoulder, but utilities are installed, installed in the shoulder all the time. And then just the last thing, the open space proposal. I thought that a new open space regulations required open space only on a subdivision of four lots or so. Oh, on all lots. All, all subdivisions. I'll have to look at that. Okay. Thank you. Can um, I look at that? Dave, most of these things, I think, are just issues to clear up the staff. Except for the, um, what Michael was just talking about, in our subdivision section 111-303, which recently was redone, um, actually last November, I think, we, we finished that up. Um, we don't have the ability to waive that requirement <coughs> under our regulations. There are, there is a, a section that calls for exclusions on lots, on subdivisions less than five lots, but only if it's a transfer for no money to other family members. So if this subdivision is being done to provide property for other family members, you can look towards that exclusion. If this is being done to, to sell lots and build houses, then the open space uh, requirement stands and you have to Check the regulations. There's a, a number of 
scenario is if you don't have space on site, uh, what you can do. But uh, I, I think. Yeah, I'll I'll review it. You and your I, I think client we'll, should come back to the commission with a, a recommendation or a request for how you would like to handle that. I think our meeting with staff and the adoption of that regulation were almost simultaneously, or it was I think it was described as it's a it may be adopted when we had our pre. So I'll we'll take a look at it. We'll come okay. back. Okay. Um, that was the only thing I had. Will, do you have anything else uh, right at this moment? Nothing new. No. All right, then um, why don't we see if there's any input from the public. Is there anyone here who would like to speak in favor of this application? Is there anyone here who would like to speak in opposition? Any general questions or comments? Name and address for the record, please. Hi, my name is Mike Whiteman. I own the property behind uh, the, this proposed subdivision. I, is this just a general question? That there's a, the pond has a stream that comes towards my property, onto my property, and over the years it, it's been eroding and eroding and eroding. And maybe this is not the proper location to do this, but could something be addressed with that at this point? When, the, when this work is going on, because it's just eating away in, onto my woods, into my woods. I was out there tonight, actually, looking at, there's, there's beavers and stuff back there now, too. But it's it's really getting pretty pretty bad. So I'm, I, it, can something be done about that during this construction, or is this inappropriate for me to be asking this? At this? That, that's not something that would be part of planning and zoning. Um, we're strictly looking at the subdivision of the property. Okay. But right. anything that would happen within the wetlands, uh, perhaps you'd want to talk to someone in the Inland Wetlands Department. Okay. Um, you know, here in Town Hall. Yeah. That that would probably be your best bet. Okay. That, that was the only question. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else with a general question or comment? All right, back to you, Dave. Thank you for your consideration, and between now and your next meeting, we'll try to resolve uh, these these issues with staff and we will look into the open space situation. Do you think you can make this submission deadline of next Tuesday? Depends upon, I think it really depends upon getting together with uh, with Scott on his issues. Well, why don't we, do I think, why don't we I continue think we until the fourth and if, if you can't get the stuff in by uh, next Wednesday the 27th, you know, yeah. You can always just drop them a note and we'll continue right. to the next meeting. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. Continue to the fourth. 7.46 p.m. With Connecticut General Statute Section 8-7D, a public hearing will be held in the Town Hall Council Chamber 7 Fan Hill Road, Monroe, Connecticut, on Thursday, March 21st, 2019, at 7 p.m. or soon thereafter, concerning the following. Um, SEP 2019-01, file number 1609A, 17 Enterprise Drive, Industrial District 2. Special exception permit application for reinstatement of a lapsed industrial lot development including site modifications in support of said reinstatement. JNS Industries, LLC, Chair James and Cheryl Del Medico, uh, members, owner, applicant. Will, what do we have for exhibits? Exhibit one, special exception from the application. Exhibit two, plan set. Exhibit three, PNZ, IT comments. Exhibit four, certified mail receipts and green cards from the and the Department of Public Health. Exhibit five, AOT engineer comments. And exhibit six, uh, green card receipts for aquarium health 
Do you have for the hearing? Hmm? Do you have for the hearing? Excuse me? So I, I, think, I think we probably provided oh, the... the here. Yeah. She didn't have it written down. I just didn't have it. She didn't have it written down. We typically submit copies of the letters provided to them and the receipt that we provided the notice, but those are the actual green yards themselves. No, I know that. I'm talking oh. about... Did you not send out notices to the voters? We did. That's what I'm looking for. The receipts okay. for that. We did. Um, so I got a bunch of calls from neighbors asking about it. Um, but I don't have those with me, but we did do them, and I do have all the green okay. cards, because those are... That's his aquarium details. Right. Yeah, we, we did do... So I need these for the hearing. I don't have them with me, but we do have them. We have them all at our office. We did provide all those notices. <clears throat> so... Hi, uh, good evening members of the I'm a licensed professional engineer in the state of Connecticut with Soli Engineering. <laughs> Office is located here in Monroe at 501 Main Street. Um, so we're here tonight to talk about a uh, property at 17 Enterprise Drive in the business park. Um, this property, uh, so just to orient everybody, uh, this property is part of the Pepper Street Business Park uh, along the northern edge of town, 25 runs north south, uh, this location here. This was developed as part of the first phase of the business park at 17 Enterprise Drive. Uh, it's approximately 12.3 acres. It was initially approved in 2007 um, for two industrial buildings or uh, a phase one building and then a second building was shown on the approval as part of phase two. The building was built in 2008 um, and uh, um, building associated parking, et cetera. That was approved, as you can see here. So this is actually approved site plan. It shows the proposed building as part of phase one, a uh, ghosted building for proposed for phase two, associated utilities, parking, uh, landscaping, um, et cetera. It was constructed and occupied. Uh, however, a certificate of occupancy was never issued. Um, so this site has kind of been back before the commission uh, multiple times throughout that process. And actually recently, a regulation amendment was approved to the benefit of this property to allow for arborists and um, landscaper to be permitted use of the zone. Um, the building was built by uh, uh, JNS Enterprises, um, and they operate Jim's Tree Service, uh, and they did occupy the building. Um, however, obviously, the CEO was not that ever granted. So we're here tonight to try to clean that up. So there were previous teams, part of this process and part of this project. Um, we were brought in to try to bring some resolution to it, get something before the commission that we can um, address, and try to get this moved on to actually look forward to a phase two. So when we first um, got involved, there was there was extensive requests for, for COs, and a, and a report was issued in September of last year, which was the status of compliance of approved permits and plans. Um, and there were a number of items that were that had been provided on the as fields which were still deficient. So our focus when we took over was we want to look through all of those items that were still outstanding for the initial permit. We wanted to review we review those with staff, and we wanted to come and review those with the commission and address those specific items to try to get to a resolution where we can actually get phase one approved and closed out, and we can move forward on uh, move forward to phase two and get a, a certificate of occupancy issued for the building. Um, we provided a narrative with our application, which kind of summarizes the overall project and identifies um, point by point list of all of those uh, status of compliance for the approved permits. Um, and what we're proposing is to essentially break out some of those items that we can address now immediately and then uh, identify a number of other items that we'd like to address as part of the phased construction for phase two. Now, we certainly understand that it's hard for the commission to say, oh, we'll, we'll put that off till later without anything. Um, established to uh, create that requirement. Um, and since we don't have an application in before the commission at this point, we, what we're proposing is to include things to be done as part of phase two, but in the absence of phase two ever getting approved, having an additional deadline for those items to be completed. Um, uh, so I'm just gonna run through the information that we provided and then uh, talk through the various items and I'm gonna run through the comments that we received from both Scott and from Will. 
Um, so we, we did submit and provide an updated uh, as-built survey, uh, which was essentially expanded upon from what the previous as-built that was provided by the, the, the former team. It did have some deficiencies, so we tried to address some of those. Um, as part of the previous approval, there was a conservation eas easement um, proposed. The formal documentation associated with this easement wasn't ever formally filed, so that is something we'd be proposing to take care of now as part of that uh, conditional CO for phase one. Um, we also provided some additional detail in terms of locations of some subsurface drainage, uh, invert information, uh, et cetera. So, um, in terms of our proposed site plan, um, I'm going to run through all the items that were from that compliance list and uh, talk through what we're proposing now, proposing to part phase two, and go through the rest of the list. Is this the list as part of your narrative? Yes. Right. Yep. So, on our site plan, uh, one of the questions had to do with our parking summary, and we do have, and I'll touch on, we did do an updated floor plan of the existing building. And uh, so previously approved, there were uh, 57 parking spaces shown on the approval. The current plan provides 62 parking spaces, and one of the comments was there were, there were additional parking spaces shown in one area. Um, uh, based on the actual use and operation of that building, there's 42 parking spaces Required. So we're simply requesting the commission approve and allow those parking spaces as constructed to stay on the site. Um, there were a number of comments about striping. The majority of the striping has been installed. It is shown on the survey. Um, we do have to add the yellow line for the divider for the, the, the painted divider for the entrance driveway, which is something that we would do as part of the conditional certificate of occupancy for phase one. We want to do that uh, immediately. Um, one of the comments had to do with the approved plan showed a landscaped island across the front of the building. However, when the building was constructed, they brought asphalt all the way to the face of that building. Um, we are requesting the commission approve and, and allow for that condition to remain. Um, we feel trying to rip all that asphalt out would be incredibly uh, somewhat destructive and uh, create a, a, a lot of mess and a lot of uh, undue disturbance that we'd like to actually request the commission allow for that to remain as it is, um, uh, as it's been installed. Where is that on the app? So um, you can see on the approved plan, it's a survey. this showed a curved island or a, you know, a raised curb along the front of the building here that wrapped around. So it wasn't, it was, a, it was a raised curved island, so it didn't have paving all the way up to the building. As shown on our as-built and our site plan, there is asphalt all the way up to the building edge, and we're just looking to maintain that as it's been constructed. Um, the, <coughs> we talked about the, the, the painting, the, the striping was complete. The traffic control island uh, along the northern edge of the building here, this was constructed slightly outside of what was previously approved. We'd like to keep that geometry the way that it is. Um, we don't want to make modifications to it now. So we want to, if any modification we need, we can make it as part of phase two. So we want to we request the commission allow that to stay as constructed. Um, the surface course of paving for the rear of the property, uh, only millings, or excuse me, not millings, the binder course of asphalt was installed as part of the initial <coughs> construction of the building. And that actually is held up pretty well there's uh, you know, potholes or major issues back there. And the, bind the surface course wasn't installed because ideally they wanted to do this final paving once phase two was constructed. We're requesting to maintain that in its current condition with only the binder course installed because there's no impact from an operation standpoint or there's no hazard or anything like that. So we'd like to leave that as a binder course and install the surface course as part of the final construction as part of phase two. Um, the conservation easement, as I mentioned, that's something that we'll be, we will provide a, a, a map for. We'll provide a document which is consistent with other easements that's been filed in the town. Um, we have one that was done as part of the uh, 10 Victoria or 2 Victoria property in 2003. Uh, unless the staff has another more recent conservation easement document they'd like us to use as a, as a base document, but we're happy to, to work with staff and get that filed. And yeah, we might have one on. 575, 579 main, I think. Um, the disturbance, uh, so there was an area that was approved as part of phase two on the initial site plan that, that was disturbed um, and there were some millings placed. 
we're simply requesting that to stay in its current condition and, and to be restored or, or as part of the construction of phase two. Where is that? Uh, it's an area, area back here. The whole area? Yes. It's all millings now? Yes. So we, we're, we're requesting to leave that in its current condition, um, uh, but restored as part of a phase two of the property. And I'll show you a, a concept plan that we're working on bringing into the commission. Um, and then dumpsters, right now, this entire area back here is being used for dumpster storage and some, and some other storage. And, and obviously, from an outdoor storage standpoint, we acknowledge that we're allowed 20% of the building area. So we are looking to demarcate and establish an area of 6,000 square feet behind the building so it's, so it's appropriately screened. And that would be where we'd be limited to, be used, to, to use this outdoor storage area for. Um, nope, that would be something we would do now. We'd establish that. We'd, we'd define that area so that between now and the future, that the area that we could use for outdoor storage would be limited to that 6,000 square feet. So you're going to handle that before the phase two, you're saying, right? Yes. We're, we're, going to, we're going to handle the cleanup and the consolidation and the establishment of the defined area for that at this point. Okay. Um, from a landscaping standpoint, um, the previously approved site plan did have landscaping. It had a lot of trees and shrubs. Um, what we've done is we've tried to take a different approach and actually create something that focuses on specific areas and creates a little bit of a better um, aesthetic. Uh, I will say the trees that were installed were far bigger and far of, of superior qual quality than what was previously approved. Um, but we obviously uh, understand and acknowledge that we do need to add some additional landscaping. So what we've done is we've focused on some of the landscaped islands and uh, some additional uh, trees and collections of shrubs and, and plants along the front to kind of fill in some of these gaps um, and potentially some additional uh, landscaping along the, the northerly side of the driveway. Um, we did even make some changes to this based on Will's comments, which we received uh, last week. I don't like to come in and dump a bunch of revised plans on you guys, so this presentation does include some revisions based on the comments that we got from staff. Um, and this, so this is what we'd like to, uh, we're obviously here to discuss with you. So, um, again, we, we don't want to rip out this from a landscaping standpoint. We want to maintain that as it is, but we've, we've provided a landscape plan which does have some additional plantings. Uh, one of Will's comments had to do with uh, adding an additional tree in this island here. As part of phase two, which I'll show you, we would be looking to make some modifications to that island at that time. Um, so I didn't want to plant a tree that we would just be ripping out later, but we did add another tree kind of across the drive from that in this location, which would be out of the way from a phase two development. Uh, one of the other comments had to do with the, the slope that was installed. So this, this site was excavated down and there was a slope established along the northerly property line. Uh, part of the previous approval did have that being a vegetated, stabilized slope. Um, and uh, boulders were installed to kind of create a stabilized uh, riprap boulder slope. Um, that area is established. It's been there for a long time. I will say if the commission had a chance to drive through this property, it is well maintained. It is upkept. It's not, it, it doesn't look disheveled from the street. And, and frankly, this, the slope that exists, um, it, it looks stable and it's, in, and it's in a stable condition. We would hate to rip all that out to try to reestablish a vegetated slope. It'd be incredibly disrupt, disruptive and destructive and it would create a whole lot of mess and we'd like to request to maintain that. Um, we did provide some additional landscaping or additional tree in front of it, um, uh, so but to potentially mask it a little bit, but we don't want to go through the effort of ripping that up, so we would like the commission to consider that, to allow that to stay in its condition. Would you consider two or three pockets of landscaping in front of that riprap slope, down at the toe of the slope, just something to break up that that line, that visual line. I, I certainly think that's something the, the, the applicant would consider. I mean, we we want to get this, and, and I've been and remiss for not introducing them, um, but with me this evening is, is Jim and Shay Del Medico, the property owners, and Brian Atherton, their broker. Um, and they are here, and they are very anxious to get this behind them. They want to get the CO <coughs> issue. They want to get out from, from the, the, the cloud that has been around this building since since 2008. So I think they certainly something we'd be to, to address it. So, so you say you will do it then? I think we can add some additional landscaping along okay. the, the, the base of that. Yes. Yeah. Um, 
from a lighting standpoint, uh, there were, in the original approved plans, there were nine light poles shown throughout the parking lot and a few wall packs. What was installed, they actually didn't install any light poles, but they did add additional wall packs from what was previously approved. We went out, we actually did a photometric study to determine what's out there now and determine those light levels. So in the packet is a, is a lighting plan that shows existing light levels. And then we also did a proposed lighting plan um, because essentially around the building, um, the light levels are um, appropriate for the use. And again, it's been operational since 2008. There hasn't been any issues from a lighting standpoint. Um, however, it is a little bit dark at the driveway. So what we propose is, as part of phase one would be to install one light pole at um, the driveway itself. Mm -hmm. And then as part of phase two, if the building isn't constructed, we would install an additional two light poles in the rear just to lighten up these back corners a little bit. Um, but at this point, we would only like to do this one light pole at the driveway as part of phase one. And that's actually incorporated into our landscape plan. We have some additional uh, plantings and shrubs around that light pole uh, just from an aesthetic standpoint. Your adequate lighting on the <coughs> easternmost section of parking? I mean, you're down to 0 0.1, 0 0.0. It's, it's pretty dark over in that stretch of park. You know, from an operation standpoint, this isn't a retail operation or a residential operation where we actually have a lot of activity at night. No, it's not now, but that's not to say if some sub subsequent owner of this building might have a manufacturing facility that runs a second shift. You know, it's we're not looking at now, we're looking at potential mm -hmm. for the property. Well, I'm, just, I'm concerned about how dark it is along those front parking spaces. Mm -hmm. So just take a look at that. And the parking itself is actually, you have point two through the majority of that. It's only the one corner, this location here. You can see this is the actual point two light level. So it's only in this one little spot at the end. So we didn't have as much of a concern from a safety standpoint that, that would create a problem or pose a problem from an operations um, standpoint. Um, certainly not to necessitate the need of an additional poll uh, that we felt, but um, if the commission feels strongly about it, you know, again, the, the, the regulations do not prescribe specific lighting requirements, simply that you provide lighting in accordance with, you know, somewhat industry standards. Um, from, a, from, a, uh, from an operations, given the use, given the time of operation, we feel that the lighting that's, that's established throughout the wall packs and the addition of the additional pole at the driveway would be sufficient for the operation of the facility, but obviously the commission has ultimate um, review and approval over that. So. And are these wall packs all compliant fixtures? Yes, and, and um, it's shown on here, but we did have an existing, uh, an image of the existing wall pack fixture, so it is a recessed light. Um, it is not a visible light source. Um, and we do have a detail of that. Well, well we have a pole light. No I, no, I understand that. So again, so, so from Will's comments that we got last week, we made some revisions to the plans. We just, and I'm presenting those to you, but we didn't drop the plans to you. Um, we did, and again, this isn't a plan that you have in your packet, but we did uh, refine a floor plan of the existing building to establish the, the various uses. It's primarily warehouse use. There is a mezzanine area for an office, um, but from a zoning standpoint, from a parking standpoint, the overall operation requires 42 parking spaces based on the square footage that's established. And we'll provide this floor plan um, for the commission's consideration. Um, and then as part of phase two, um, we are, like as I stated, we are actively working on trying to bring an application for this phase two of the site. So what phase two proposes is a 28,440 uh, square foot footprint with, um, Two loading docks to accommodate, you know, potentially one tenant or multiple tenants, and two small mezzanine areas, both just under 3,000 square feet. Um, from an overall standpoint, this layout would require uh, 95 parking spaces, and we've provided 115, so there's ample parking, um, and it's generally consistent with the previous approval. I will say, you know, one of the um, as part of the original original approval. You know, they did have this area shown for phase two. There was a sediment trap proposed as part of that construction. That was actually excavated and started as part of this, and then uh, as, as phase two never proceeded, it created a, a low-lying area here, which is actually uh, 
subsequently been flagged as well. So it's something we have to contend with from a, from a development standpoint. But, um, so this does show what we would be proposing potentially as part of phase two, um, which we're anxious to, to, to bring before the commission. Uh, I have just a couple photos. Um, so this actually shows that boulder slope. Again, we don't think this is in its, in its current condition in terms of the aesthetic. And again, I think we can, to, to Chairman Porter's uh, comment, I think we can probably add some pockets of some landscaping in front of to break up the, to break that up. Um, here's a picture just looking down the driveway. You can see that slope. Um, and we can add some additional landscaping out front. We're proposing a pole in this location. And we can add that yellow stripe um, through here as part of what we're looking to do for phase one. And then one of the comments, which I'll, which I'll get on later, had to do with the buffer plantings for the rear of the property. There's actually a really extensive buffer, wooded buffer, primarily deciduous trees out there now. But this picture was taken, I think, this morning. And even, if, even though they're only deciduous trees, and it is um, March, you really can't see through there. Um, uh, and, and the majority of that buffer would even remain as part of the phase two development. So um, now we can kind of, I'd like to go through uh, staff comments. Uh, we can kind of address each one. Scott's were easy, so we'll touch on his first. Um, no comments from a public improvement standpoint for traffic and safety. The parking spaces should be line striped for safety purposes. Uh, the, the spaces are striped. We would just add that yellow line at this point. The painted offset lane divider at the exit should be provided. We would do that. Additional spot elevations of the handicapped parking spaces should be provided in order to have enough information to confirm ADA compliance. We will comply with that requirement and ensure that, that all those spaces are constructed with ADA. Um, to comply with that is part of the issuance of this conditional uh, CO. Drainage and utilities, elevation and invert information provided will be reviewed for comment prior to bond release. And then the bond recommendation. Um, so there's a $45,000 cash bond that's been held by the town since 2008. Um, obviously, the, the previous approval has lapsed, but that's still in place, and we'd be happy to provide a, a modified bond agreement. Um, and then, hopefully, once this is finalized, even potentially a bond reduction request, because the, the improvements themselves have been uh, have been constructed. Um, so hopefully, maybe the owners can get some of that bond release to them back. Um, and then to Will's comments. Um, so number one, as noted above, the 2007 SEC approval was granted. The allowance for an arborist landscaper was not permitted, as it is. Um, we can we, we revise the narrative to include the, the language regarding that as a use in this, in this application, and we even showed that on our um, floor plan, the area that's currently occupied by uh, Jim's Tree Service. The balance of it is being used for warehouse space. So we can include that additional language in the narrative. Um, and it does comply with the requirements established for that use. Uh, the outside storage and dumpster containers. Um, so uh, we need to demonstrate compliance with the various sections of the regs regarding that. What we're proposing is to basically uh, establish this area. It's about 6,000 square feet permitted based on the size of the building. We're looking to demark, slide it over, make sure it's behind the building so it's adequately screened from the road, and then delineate this with, with a series of boulders. Um, we think we can do that to kind of establish where that area and, and demarcate in the field and delineate where, the, where that stuff can be and where it shouldn't be. Um, but Mr. Soley, where is that going to be once you start the second building? Well, if we do phase two, when we do phase two, we would likely look to potentially move those over to a landscaped area over here. We didn't want to propose that at this point because right now the, what we're proposing um, does not require any modifications to the wetlands permit. We're simply trying to get the CO for, for the building, which essentially gets double through planning and zoning. So in all of our meetings with staff, provided we weren't doing any work in the regulated area, which we are not proposing, we had no requirement to go to wetlands. If we were to move that staging area or outdoor storage area to this location now, we'd have to go to wetlands to get that approved. So we want to basically use the area, the milling area in the back where it currently is, shrink it down, demarcate where it can go, and then as part of phase two, we'll deal with um, wetlands to, to, to move those into an area over here. Um, but that is hopefully in the near future. Immediate, yes. All right. 
Yeah. You don't see issues with the septic system? No, that septic system is, you know, um, <coughs> those are those septic systems are installed and, and the um, the type of system that's been installed is adequate for H20 loading, provided we have two feet of cover over, it's not gonna have an impact on the system. The same way you can put those systems on our parking lots. So um, that's how we'd like to address the, the staging and the st or the storage storage area. Excuse me. Um, the floor plan, uh, the comment number three. Again, we we prepared one. We provided it, and it demonstrates what the overall requirements are. We can provide this to the commission and the staff for their consideration. Um, provide a draft conservation easement survey and associated legal instruments. Um, uh, again, we can provide that. <coughs> We have it demarcated on our survey. We did provide a legal description for that easement as part of our application, um, but the actual legal instrument is something we can we can work with staff and, and provide. Um, uh, provide wetland verification of compliance in regard to existing and proposed site improvements. So we, I, I guess we'll, we'll, we'll somewhat defer to staff and the wetlands agent for further clarification on that, because I think when we had an, our initial meeting with staff to talk about getting this to the next step, um, I didn't, I don't remember wetlands being an outstanding issue, but we'll certainly defer to whatever staff requires of us to, to make sure that's signed off on. Um, and then six, the commission should determine the acceptability of the applicant's proposed implementation schedule. So what we'd like to do uh, in order to get the conditional certificate of occupancy uh, issued is the, we want to install the landscaping as we have proposed, um, recording the conservation easement, and installation of the boundary markers for the conservation easement, uh, and actually even the, this light pole. Um, we'd like to do that by June 30th of this year. <coughs> and then the balance of the improvements that we've shown on here, um, we'd like to defer until October of 2020, um, which will give us sufficient time to actually proceed with phase two, commence construction as part of phase two, and do everything as part of that phase two construction. But that second, time limit does is it says if, if, if we don't get our act together, if we don't get approvals, if we don't start construction for phase two, we're obligated to do the rest of these, the rest of these things by that date. So that would be, um, you know, the removal, the removal of all these millings, you know, establishing seed, the uh, final surface course of the pavement in the back, you know, all those other elements that we don't want to do now because we're trying to avoid additional site disturbance and minimize that at this point. Um, but obviously we understand that we need to, we still need to commit to do those items. Um, prefer to do it as part of the construction for phase two, but in the absence of that, we're willing to commit to do it by the, by October of 2020. Um, Along those lines, um, you know, this could potentially defer any of the, this finalization till next October, a year and a half from now. Um, I would almost be, happier to see something about if you don't start phase two by such and such a date in 2019 that you will complete these items. Start the construction of phase two in 2019? Yeah. Um, my, only, my only concern with that, and I'm happy to, I'm happy to even tie it to starting the, starting to the date being tied to the construction of phase two. However, the process to go through the land use department the Wetlands Commission, the Planning and Zoning Commission, the Building Department, the review of approval process, the likelihood that we could start site construction by fall of 2019, I'm, I'm reluctant to make a commitment of that because a lot of that's outside of my control. Um, and it's outside of the applicant's control. So given that, you know, we, ha we have projects that were approved last October that we're still trying to get through the ROA process. So, um, I don't want to commit to a time frame that we have a shovel on the ground by October because that's there's a lot of outside influences that we can't control. So, what you're proposing is all of these phase one items will be completed no later than October 31st, 2020, regardless of the status of phase two. Yes. Okay. You don't want to tie it to the construction. You could tie it to a permit application to this commission. Yeah. Well, let's give that some thought. Um, 
moving on with Will's comments uh, on the site plan number seven, delete S1. We took that plan out again. We just wanted to provide it to the commission as a point of reference <coughs> to what was previously approved. Um, uh, number eight, revise the zoning location survey as follows. Delete the zoning compliance table. We left that, we put that on because it's a requirement of the as-built. Um, so we were, initially we were trying to basically revise the as-built so it complied with those other conditions, um, which is why we left it on. Um, we can add the surrounding property owners. We can show the painted lane divider once that's done. And uh, we did add the variance note. Um, revise the site layout plan as follows. Uh, show the ZBA variance. We can add that to the plan. I think we, we did here. Um, the added pavement extending from the parking spaces to the building edge was originally planned and approved as a landscape bed. Again, we, we've proposed additional landscaping throughout the site and we re 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 uh, request the commission allow that pavement to stay as, as installed. Configuration and size of the traffic control islands at the northern side of the building are slightly different than originally approved and paved over. Um, the differences in configuration is acceptable provided the current proposed landscaping for these islands is expanded to also include a shade or ornamental tree at each, in addition to the proposed shrub planting. So we've shown that additional shrub plantings and tree here. We've added additional shrub, shrub plantings in this island. However, as part of phase two, in order to accommodate truck turning movements, we would be potentially pulling that island back. So I don't want to install a tree that we would just end up ripping out later. Can you also look in phase two point when you pull it back? Because the part of the island that goes towards the street is kind of short change to the back of the parking space. So there's no reason for that extra pavement. So maybe you could make the island bigger at that time in that area. I think we could certainly do that. You might be able to kind of treat that time. Yeah, I, I think I think that's certainly something we can look at. Um, but to Will's point, wanting additional shade tree there rather than put it in a spot where it would potentially be disrupted, we propose one across the drive. Yeah, well, that could help with your boulder slope too. Um, the lane divider at the site entrance. We talked about that and we've shown that. Um, revised zoning compliance table, uh, we, we can make all those revisions to, to, to meet Will's requirements. Um, revisions to the landscape plan. As commented above, add a tree to each landscape island located on the northern side of the building. We just discussed those two. Um, remove the excess parking pavement and provide landscaping as intended with the original SE, SEC, SEP approval. Again, we, we're focused more on the perimeter rather than ripping this out, and we, and we request the commission approve that. Uh, at, shrub at shrub plantings, flanking the site entrance drive, similar to the original approval. Um, again, we've, we've shown uh, some additional landscaping around a proposed uh, pole light, a tree. Um, we don't want to, and we're simply requesting the commission to approve the, this plan uh, as, we, as we presented this evening. Uh, the tree, and, uh, similar to the others, uh, add an additional tree and shrub massing in the remaining gap in the front yard. Add a second group at the southern end of the front parking lot and a third group on the side at the far southern end of the front parking lot. So we actually, um, we've, what we've done is there's existing trees here, 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 and here. We've, we're proposing trees and shrub massings in between to fill in these three gaps. We did have one here previously that's shown on the plan in front of you, but there are actually a number of underground utilities that come through here, the water and gas, so we'd prefer to not plant additional trees there. And I think with the additional of these tree and shrub massings, we think we're gonna create a really nice aesthetic. And again, I think this the, the building itself is well-maintained, it does look good. Um, uh, so that's what we're requesting the commission to approve at this time. Provide verification of the adequacy of existing vegetation or propose rear, rear yard buffer screening along portions of the site abutting the trail. Um, <coughs> so we have an existing densely deciduous trail and tree line through here. We're looking to maintain that. I don't want to cut down deciduous trees to install evergreens. And this will all get dealt with as part of phase two. So at this point, we're requesting not to do additional landscaping back here. 
provide a remediation landscaping plan more than seating associated with the removal of the unauthorized milling in the rear of the property uh, to be implemented should plans for phase two not be timely pursued or implemented. Um, we'd like to, we'd, again, we'd request that this area, if by whatever date the commission determines for phase two, um, we'd like to simply remove the millings and then seed this area rather than do an extensive landscape plan back there. So you do want to remove the millings? We don't want to remove the millings until we actually proceed with phase two or that second Unless deadline that the commission deadline. establishes. Okay. Um, but, we're, but we're simply requesting to seed that area rather than do a robust landscaping plan. If we don't meet the deadline. Correct. Perhaps you can do a metal mix rather than a... Oh, sure. Yeah. Maybe you do a mow once or twice in depth. A no mow grass mix. Um, provides a proposed installation size for the flowering dogwood to diameter breast height. We can, we can do that. We did on the revised plan here. Show the proposed <coughs> freestanding light posts and provide plantings at the base consistent with zoning 6.2.210. Uh, we did add that pole and we did add some uh, shrubs to the base of it. The installed rubble stone slope along the northern property line was supposed to be an uh, even vegetated slope. Um, they'd like us to remove a portion of it, um, even if not the whole thing from like basically the building back. Again, we're requesting to maintain that as it is, and I think we can add some additional trees to the base. You know, what you're showing out here, you have the, the tree up in the corner of the lot by the road, you have the one back by the back corner of the building. If you evenly spaced a couple more trees in there with some, you know, a deciduous tree sure. with some shrub plantings around the base, Absolutely. I think that would. Um, that would, is there a room in there to do that? It's pretty narrow, um, and there is, I think there's a, a, a drain along the base there, because we do obviously have runoff coming off that slope, which kind of gets collected and, and, and uh, dealt with. Um, but I think we could probably provide, there's sufficient width to provide something in there. Um, you can probably see it best on this picture. Yeah, so you can see there's a, there is an area, and there's, there's gravel, which we could potentially look at some of these areas and, and provide some topsoil rather than some of that stone. So that was supposed to be a natural slope? It's supposed to be topsoiled and seeded. <laughs> and, you know, I think a lot of stuff was shown on plans that may not have been fully vetted. Because um, this was just called that as a, a, a no, this one here. And that's a pretty steep slope, yeah. and, it, and it lacked some sufficient information in terms of how that was going to be stabilized and seeded. Um, we know, I know the intent, but I think in practice, that's why that folder was actually established. Engineers. Can't trust that. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, lighting plan revisions, number 11. Uh, reconcile the light pole detail uh, showing 14 feet versus 20 feet. And, and from a lighting standpoint, uh, what we, what we propose, and we did correct it on here, this pole we propose to be 14 feet tall because we want to make sure we're not, despite the, I don't see the town engineer here who always has a different opinion about lighting in driveways. Um, oops. But we did a 14 foot high pole here to make sure we didn't uh, have light levels leaving the property line outside of the requirements. Um, but the poles in the back would likely be 20 foot high poles just to get better light spread and better light distribution. That's because he lives in New Haven County. Huh? That's because he lives in New Haven County. <laughs> um, provided detail and specifications for the existing wall lights matching the photometric plans. Uh, again, we did add that to the lighting plan. Calculation of average illumination. Um, compliance for the standards and six-point illumination table there. Um, Yeah, it's actually the requirement is 0.75 to five foot candles, which is a pretty broad requirement. And our proposed is 1.74. So it's well within that limit. Does that lighting drop off to zero to <coughs> the, um, the uh, wetlands in the it, it does. southern portion? It I does, can't yes. See it yep. Okay. And on the photometric plane, and that the does. On the west. Yeah, the light plan is in there. The last sheet. Yeah, it's 2.71. Okay. 
Okay, sorry. Um, number 12, provision for an appropriately sited and configured site dumpster enclosure. Um, shown, so we did add that to the plan, um, but as of right now, um, all the garbage is handled um, through residential trash cans that are kept inside the buildings. We'd like to propose to maintain that, that out from an operation standpoint. However, we did show and we can show, um, if necessary, a dumpster pad. You know, we actually showed it here, but I don't want to do that there because that'd be the regulated area. So we can maybe show another dumpster pad at the base of the, the, the slope over here um, with the appropriate dumpster enclosure. We're not looking to install that now. We're simply, I know on previous applications, when we've requested to just use residential garbage cans that stay inside the building, we've simply had a placeholder where that could possibly go in the future. Um, so that's what we, if we, want to need, if we need to keep a placeholder, we, I'd recommend to put it here. Um, but then as part of phase two, we'd probably end up moving it over to this side. Um, and any intended freestanding or building signs would need to be detailed. We're not looking to propose any of that at this point as part of this phase one CO final coordination. As part of phase two, if we're showing a proposed building, we would deal with it at that time. So we have put the note on? Uh, we did add a note, yes. So with that, we'd be happy to uh, answer any questions the commission have, um, but I think we've, re we've reviewed Scott's comments, Will's comments, and essentially laid out how we'd like to proceed with this. Ryan? No questions. No questions. Um, phase two. Um, I'm kind of with Bill. I. I um, I think that's a long deadline, personally myself. Um, if we could shorten that up, that would be something I think would be in better interest. Um, I do like the uh, the adding of the, the shrubbery on that on that slope. Um, <clears throat> I'm with you, so if you're gonna do phase two, some of the stuff that you are gonna add, I don't wanna see you take it out and then put it back in somewhere else. Like I'm, I'm totally with that. I, it doesn't make any sense to, to go about it. Um, it's just that deadline that's kind of, kind of in my head right now, that's all. <coughs> no, I think we hit on most of the stuff that we wanted you to cover. So you say, your proposed deadline on, <coughs> on phase one is June 2019. Yes. Yeah, essentially the landscaping we can do, I mean, it's getting to that time now. Right. Um, but they're obviously anxious to get a CO. So they'd like and to get take that. care of the containers behind it by then, too, right? Yes. Yes. All right, I'm good. Okay. It's Michael. Oh, yeah. Um, the landscape bed that's not there in front of the building. What did, how deep is that? And what was the width of that? Oh, yeah. Let's see. I mean, from the approval plan. It uh, should be on the approval plan. It's not actually dimensioned. I don't think it's actually mentioned. I mean, I'd say even what was shown was probably maybe three or four feet. I don't even think it was a full uh, sidewalk width. Okay. Uh, uh, whatever your landing is. is <coughs> it's the depth of the landing.
Well, we just don't like to lose you know, pervious to impervious surfaces, obviously. It's somewhere between three and four. Yeah. So even from a, you know, and it wasn't, it wasn't, it wasn't approved with substantial landscaping in it. There were no shrubs proposed. There were no. no I, think there were. I mean, this is the approved site plan. It shows all of the other. There's a separate plan for landscaping. Okay. How many it is that? Can you zoom in? Or maybe the separate plan had a, a schedule. Box around the entire building. Yeah, I. Oh, it's I mean, this is showing landscaping, shrubs, and trees, yeah. and there was nothing proposed in there. So I don't think we're really losing much by not having it. Yeah. And frankly, I think it'd be a lot of disruption oh, or yeah. disturbance. Yeah. So I'm more concerned with the um, easement. The conservation easement. Yeah, I mean, it looks like phase two is butted right up against the conservation easement. So I would be interested to see um, what kind of easement and what the language is going to be in the easement. So um, the typical conservation easements that are established basically say, and I'm, I'm referring to one, we haven't done one recently. I don't think the commission. So do we that. come up with one and then you sign off on it, or do you negotiate? T typically, what, what what it does is so those easements are given to the benefit of the town, and basically it prevents, uh, it creates a bunch of restrictions, right. so that you can't build a building in it, you can't cut any trees down, you can't put any um, pesticides or anything in there, you can't, you, know, you can't do anything because it's there to, to conserve the land. Um, uh, I was reading the easement that was established for the rear of uh, two Victoria Drive, um, all the way in the back corner. That was a conservation eas easement that was established in that little strip, um, which extended out towards the side road up on top of the hill where that wetland was. Um, and that bas it basically had requirements that, again, you can't, you can't do anything in I that area. have to take a look at that. Yeah. Um, and essentially... The building the is right up there. Against well, it. well, the other component is is that it it creates an additional requirement so that anytime you make an application to the wetlands commission or planning and zoning, if a conservation easement exists on the property, you need to get a letter from the easement holder saying that your project won't impact that easement area. And that's the town of Monroe. Yes. Yes. So in the past, what we've done is we get we get a letter from the first electman saying this is where the easement is, this is what we're proposing, it's not going to impact that, it's not going to affect that. And again, even as part of the previous approvals, you know, they had this easement area, they had all kinds of, I guess these are trees shown. That was the protected trail. Yeah, stars. Hmm? That was the protected trail. Right. And, and again, I mean, I, I think I showed you that picture, the, the, there's, there's very mature deciduous trees through that whole area. Um, so from an easement standpoint, you know, we'd be consistent with what was previously approved that the adoption of the form of approval, which shows a building kind of up against it, but it also establishes everything front of house versus back of house. Nothing else happens back there other than the protection of the trees and creates an established buffer that has a little, that the town has a little bit more teeth over because it is contained within an easement area. And we're not looking to change that easement area. Right. We're looking simply to, to, to file the formal map that was established as part of the previous approval. And there was no easement assigned or agreed upon then. We'd have to go back and look at the file, see if there was any draft. All right. Thank you. Well, that's all I have. We'll look at that. It's more of a development deed restriction more than it is a conservation easement. Town kind of liberally used the word conservation easement. It was funny because it was, because the, the past ones that I've seen, it was a declaration of restrictions. No, they but are then declaration it refers to it as conservation They easement. are, right. They are declaration restrictions. A conservation unit in reality is something that has a whole analysis done about what you're protecting, right. benefits of protecting it, and it's a little bit more involved in restricting development, mm -hmm. which is what this really is. Anything else, Mike? No, thank you. 
I only have a couple of questions or comments. You know, we're trying on in every application to reduce our impervious footprint, and it seems like you're overcharged. Maybe you should just take a look and see if there's any way you can cut down on some of the pavement, reduce that footprint. Uh, same thing when you're when you're continuing your design for phase two. Um, based on your analysis, it seems like you're 10 or 15 spaces over parked there. Um, you know, it's a, it's a double edged sword. We don't want to skimp on parking by the same token. We're trying on, on all projects to reduce the impervious surface. So take a look at that. Um, and then this is just a question. Um, on the south side of the existing building, phase one building, you're showing a, a recharge system. Is that existing? It does. It exists. What it's ties installed. into that? Um, so the, the, the roof leaders tie into it. Um, and that does exist. We as part of our when we went and did our as built, we actually excavated that out and made sure we verified the ends to make sure it was installed in accordance with the plan. It's actually pretty deep. And the transformer pad is sitting on top of it. It is. Okay. Is that concrete galleries? Uh, yeah. There's a manhole there. Um, yeah. Yeah, it, I believe and it we is. Have a, we gallons. have the, the manhole rim elevation. We have the, the outlet invert, but we don't have any other. No, we, we definitely it. demarcated the limits because we exposed the ends. Um, it must be frozen or something on the leg. But it's for the leaders? Huh? It's for the leaders. Yes. Rooms. Okay. Um, those were the only questions I had right now. You know, we interjected a bunch of stuff as we went along. So that's, you know, all part of my comments. From, from a parking standpoint, you're right. And even from a, from a use standpoint, right now, the majority of the building is used for warehouse space, which has a lower parking requirement of that one per thousand square feet. Um, we'll definitely look to see how much pavement we can reduce as part of phase two. Um, but it's, 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 it's also difficult because if an industrial use wants to go in there that has a parking requirement of one per 600, the more we reduce, the more we are limited with what uses to come in in the future. Um, just throw well, unless you there. leave some, you know, some reserved parking areas yeah. you know, for future. I think years. that's something we can look at. Absolutely. And the, um, uh, you know, and even from even from an existing standpoint, the <coughs> warehouse space that's there, even though it's required one per thousand, they're using fewer. They have far fewer employees. They don't have the demand from a parking standpoint. So, so I agree with you. I think that's something overall. You guys been working on your parking regs to create a better opportunity to, to land bank some. Or something. So, I think I think I think there's an opportunity to do that, uh, especially in phase two, <coughs> right? Especially for getting close to the easement. Uh, well, unless you have something else, let's see if we have any questions or comments from the public. Anyone would like to speak in favor of this application? Anyone who would like to speak in opposition? Any general questions or comments? Seeing none, back to you, Mr. Stolen. Um, you know, I, I think I'm excited to be here to get this behind us, and I know the, the owners are, um, and I hope the commission is too, because I know they, I think they've been before you a couple times, and this has kind of been hanging out there, so I think this is an opportunity to clean this up. Um, so unless there's anything further, I guess we'd be happy to. So when do you want to come back? Uh, we can Next come back. Next Wednesday would be the cutoff for the April 4th meeting or meeting after that is April 18th. Well, we can, we can, as I presented here this evening, we made all the changes based on what we're proposing. We can, I didn't want to, and we even have a response to comment letter to Will's comments. I didn't want to, I don't like to dump stuff on you guys, but we can bring this in tomorrow. So we can certainly meet well, a deadline to provide revised plans by so next Wednesday. you don't Wednesday. want to take some consideration of what the commission has offered you? Absolutely, and I think that, and that's the thing. So we can we can look at adding some additional trees at the base of the slope. Well, that's um, not submitted tomorrow. That's submitted next not week. tomorrow, but by next Wednesday. <laughs> so so the I mean, so if you stay up all night. You can have it. Tomorrow. 
So just to, just to rehash the things that we have to address in order to get this resolved and revised is I think, I think the, the main things that I heard were um, a little bit more uh, thought into this second phase of the deadline and maybe, and I guess maybe we can talk through that. Would the commission rather see that tied to the start of construction for phase two, tied to the application for phase two, or I still think the commission should have a drop dead date on when it has to be done. Our concern is, I know you're aware, is that we have too many projects in town where a plan is submitted, and I'm not saying this is the case on this project, but we have a, a plan submitted and for five or six years nothing is done and that's used as an excuse for why other things can't be completed and we don't want to get into that situation. We want to start wrapping up projects. Um, we have too many projects that are at 98% and we have to get them to 100%. Um, so that's our concern. If, if phase two is not started, we want phase one completed. So then it's really... I would look at the two prongs, getting an application in for phase two, and then it dropped it. Cause I, I was thinking there's almost two dates. It's, yeah, it's phase two construction has to start by, and if not, everything has to be completed by, you know, Again, I, I, I don't want the commission to impose dates upon you. I'd rather that you and your, your client look at your schedule yep. and, and propose something to the commission that, that you know, is a reasonable proposal and, and you know then we can go from there okay okay so we appreciate the commission's time we'll get revised plans in by next or revised information by next Wednesday and we look forward to getting this closed out on the fourth right, so we'll continue to the fourth thank you 845. with Connecticut uh, notice of public hearing to be held March 21st 2019 in accordance with Connecticut general statute section 8-7 DA a public hearing will be held in town hall council chamber 7 Canton Road 2019 at 7 p.m. or soon thereafter concerning the following RAA 2019-01 file number 1002E Zoning Regulation Text Amendments, Referral to Conservation Commission. Planning and Zoning Commission proposed Zoning Regulation Text Amendments with the addition of new Section 9.2.3C requiring that all Commission applications be referred to the Monroe Conservation and Water Resource Commission for its advisory, for its advisory review as part of the Commission <coughs> Zoning Application Review process. All right, what do we have? Well, Exhibit 1, draft zoning text amendment. Exhibit 2, uh, referral to DP, uh, state public health and acquiring water. Exhibit 3, referrals to regional planning agencies. Exhibit 4, referrals to uh, adjacent municipalities. Exhibit 5, response from West Cog. Uh, exhibit 6, green cards showing a uh, mailing notification to DPH and Aquarian. Exhibit 7, a uh, green card showing notification to adjacent municipalities. And Exhibit 8, response from uh, NV COG. Exhibit 9, public comment letter from Patrick O'Hare in opposition to the action. And Exhibit 10, Conservation and Water Commission uh, summary of the town charter and Connecticut general statutes which give the authority to the Conservation Commission. That's our exhibits. For the record, Will Gresta, applying as zoning administrator. Um, tonight we're here for a public hearing for a zoning text amendment that is proposed by the commission. Um, this is something that came out of some comments from the Conservation Commission on a separate application. 
or separate amendment. Uh, the commission um, deferred this to its own action, which is why we're here tonight. Um, essentially, the, the amendment is to include in the zoning regulations um, in writing something that's already been standard practice for many, many years, which is the referral of applications that go before this commission to the Conservation Commission to give them an opportunity to provide their valuable type of input to the community and to your commission. The uh, amendments consist of three new paragraphs. Um, the first of which is saying that you would refer applications to the uh, Conservation Water Resources Commission. The, uh, it, the, that requirement is simply to send it to them. There's no requirement that they respond. The uh, second amendment is the commission has discretion for other planning items, zoning agenda items that you feel appropriate or you desire input from the Conservation Commission. And the third is that to the extent that they do provide comments, they shall provide them within a timely manner within the, the timeline process for your application. So depending on what kind of application it is, <laughs> there is a, a timeline that's set for that application as far as what the steps are, and the Conservation Commission would have to, if they want to get your com give you comments, they would have to do it within that time frame. Um, if they don't, they don't. And that's the essential part of the... Uh, the amendments. Okay, uh, if you'll recall, when we were doing, I forget what amendment we were doing, but the Conservation Commission wanted the to. Space. Yeah, the open space. space yeah. Uh, the Conservation Commission asked that they be included in that text amendment as a, a party to review it. And we determined at that time that rather than make it just specific to that amendment, we would do a, a different text amendments that would give them a review just like we give ARB on, uh, on every application. This is a process that we've been, as Will said, doing all along anyway. Copy of the application goes to Conservation Commission uh, along with all the other uh, town entities uh, as part of the review process. But this is just kind of making it official that it goes to them so no one will forget. Does anybody have any questions or comments? There was some concern expressed to me earlier today by some parties about this potentially slowing down our review process um, or potentially causing a conflict with our, um, our review and our approval process. Again, this is an advisory report that would come from the Conservation Commission, uh, just like we get from ARB. They, uh, they can review it and give us their input, but it's non-binding, it's, it's uh, advisory only, and the Commission still has full power to make final decisions on any application. As far as the timeliness, um, it's, it, it's part of our process, so if, if the Conservation Commission wishes to respond, they have to respond within the time frame of our review process period, so it won't hold up any of our applications in any way. And I believe, like the, the other members of ART, which is mostly the staff and different departments, when we do circulate those materials, we give an indication as to when the comments are expected and it's way before, it, like you get our comments before the, before the meeting, uh, you know, about a week before, or in the mail. So they get, the, they're told the same timeline and when the hearing is, so there's a known expectation as when to get it done. So, anything? So if we don't get their comments, not a problem. We get them, great. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't see an issue with this then. I have some, some questions. Um, <clears throat> if we do it currently, then it's kind of standard now, right? So, right, how, but how did this? If there's if there's a change in the commission, which there is, you know, if there's a change in staff. If there's any change, um, right now it's a practice that we that we do this, but it's not something that we have to do by our rules and regulations. This is just formalizing it that this is now part of the process. Just like it's it's spelled out that our applications go to ARB, now it's it'll be spelled out that 
they go to the Conservation Commission. So if, when there's a changeover in personnel. But why, why, well, my question is why, why the Conservation Commission? Because that's what they're there for. Because that's, the, the, if you looked at what, um, what Will gave us from the town charter, it's when it uh, calls out the, the duties of the Conservation and Water Resource Commission, it says the commission shall have the powers and duties set forth in the Connecticut General Statutes and applicable ordinances. And then in the Connecticut General Statutes, it says the Conservation Commission shall keep an index of all open areas, and it goes on to say that um, it may make recommendations to zoning commissions, planning commissions, inland wetlands agencies, and other municipal agencies on proposed land use changes. So that's part of the Connecticut General Statutes, calls for, for that to happen. So we're just formalizing it in our regulation. What are what are some potential cons that could come out of it? None that I'm aware of. Yeah, I'm aware of yeah. What about what about like what about other commissions? I'm sorry. What about other commissions? Like, other commissions? Yeah, like EDC or youth. Like, what about you know? What if they decide yeah. they want to be able to send us letters on everything? Well, they, they don't. Those are not entities that deal with land use. Well, EDC though. They, instance, they don't deal they, with land or use. Not the use per se. Well. Land use regulation. Yeah. I don't know, I'm just, I want to make sure that if we're allowing this, yeah, it's, I don't not want to become a, yeah, it's not going to become a, how come we can't do it, how come we can't do it, how come we can't do it. Because I'm sure EDC would love to send us a letter about every single thing. They can. Yeah. There's nothing stopping them from doing now, that. Do any, any, any resident or taxpayer in the town has the right to submit information on anything that we're doing. All right, but then this just makes it that we have to send it to them. So it's basically Correct. making us required to send it to the yeah. In accordance with if the this, Connecticut General yeah, Statute. If this wasn't here, they could still access all those because they're all public record every time. They could still send us a letter every single time. Right. Well, the importance of the Conservation Commission and the mm -hmm. role it plays for the community, and you're embodying that into your uh, code. In fact, the POCD probably, I haven't looked at it, probably has some language that would point to that. And that's pretty standard, I mean, to have that. I mean, they are a body with a wealth of knowledge that you all may not have and, and isn't expected to have. So to have that resource is a valuable thing. There's definitely no downside to this. And you are recognizing a practice that's been in place for over probably 30 years. All right. We may spot something in there when we, when they get an application that we don't pick up on and they may spot it and then enlighten us and it may prove to be a very valuable one approving a plan. So that's why I don't see what's a big issue here. What it also does is by putting in the zoning regulations, it helps the development community and the residential community understand the things that are involved in an application. The section that this is being inserted includes language regarding the town clerk and filings, Inland Wetland Commission referrals and permitting, uh, the public watershed, um, regional planning agencies, abutting municipalities, <coughs> and abutting neighbors. This is all in the root section on referrals. So again, by adding something that's been done, it, it, it helps illuminate what the practice is and what the understanding is, because I think people want to understand who are all the players involved. Okay. I, uh, I also feel, though, that, that since we're already, since they're already getting a, a view of this, and we, we are kind of shedding that that stigma that it's hard to build in Monroe, this is adding another, isn't this adding another step to the application no. process? Zero. No, it's not another step. It's, it's okay. just like we have to send out to the regional planning agencies when we have an application um, for their review. I mean, it does not add a minute. It's not adding any more work. It's not adding. No. Oh, this is. What's happening now it has been for many, many years. Right. So we're just putting Since in the code. Happening. So what you've seen in the time you've been here, I don't expect that to be ramped up in any way. That's all. Yeah. And like I said, it is in the Connecticut General Statutes that this, this is supposed to happen. So we're uh, bringing our regulations more in line with, with what the state requires. 
can we go through the letter that was sent by the... Well, not yet. Not yet. Oh, but that's during the... Uh, okay. I just want to make sure we're answering his concerns. I'm happy to respond. And we can... That's, yeah. Good. But whenever that's appropriate. Okay. Does anybody else have any questions or comments? No. All right. Um, anyone from this DAP public want to speak in favor of this application? <laughs> Karen Bernaska, 99 Bagburn Road, Chair of the Monroe Conservation and Water Resources Commission. And with me this evening also is Barbara Thomas, another member of the Commission. And I would like to thank you for your consideration tonight and for having this public hearing and including uh, this uh, zoning text amendment uh, in your regulations. Um, one of the reasons that we had asked for it is based on a uh, directive from the former first selectman in, in 2017 that basically delegates the general direction and supervision responsibilities of the town of Monroe passive open space to the Conservation Commission. Um, and as you deliberate and make the decisions on zoning applications, on the acceptance of open space, open space set-asides, we look forward you know, to working with you um, and, and reviewing it, particularly in, re in regards to a passive recreational, passive open space and passive recreational opportunities. Um, we will agree with you. If, we, if you send it to us and we don't get it to you, we, you know, we lose. We don't get a comment to you. But we very much uh, look forward to giving you our comments um, and, uh, and you taking them into consideration during your deliberations and when you make your decision. Thank you. Thank you. And if we have just uh, heard about this uh, uh, letter from Mr. O'Hare in opposition, and so if you have any, we have, we have answered, Barbara has an <laughs> made her comments to them that we will uh, not be so bold as to give to you. I'm certain that you can answer his response, his questions on your own. Thank you. All right. People who want to speak in opposition, we have received a letter, and I'll just read through it quickly. Um, dear Chairman Porter, members of the Monroe Planning and Zoning Commission, I write this letter in opposition of your proposed 9.2.3C, providing regulatory recognition for the Monroe Conservation Commission to make advisory comments and or recommendations to the Monroe Planning and Zoning Commission. Here are some of my concerns. One, the Planning and Zoning Commission is an elected body. You are elected by and answerable to the people of the town of Monroe. Conservation Commission is not elected, but appointed by the first selectman after being recommended by a political party and then approved by the town council. Number two, when the Planning and Zoning Commission acts in its planning capacity, the plan of conservation and development is adopted every 10 years and is one of your tools. Please note the name of the document already includes the word conservation. Number three, in 9.2.3C1, the text requires that a copy of all applications by or to the commission shall be referred. Do you really intend every application of the Monroe Planning and Zoning Commission get referred to conservation? From the Town of Monroe webpage, I would note that there are applications including signs, community events, bond release, and time extensions, just to name a few, which are applications to the commission. Number four, also in 9.2.3C1, there is no language which directs the Conservation Commission as to what they are to advise upon. Number five, what happens um, when the Conservation Commission fails to submit its required comments? Conservation meets monthly, the Monroe PNZ meets bi-monthly, and follows state regulatory language pertaining to deadlines to make determinations. Number six, would a Monroe Planning and Zoning Commission delay a decision as it would for Wetlands Commission because the Monroe Conservation Commission has failed to render comment. The Monroe Planning and Zoning Commission already has conservation-minded input from the Wetlands Commission and local water company. You also have conservation-minded principles throughout your POCD. Adding more red tape to an already laborious application process won't provide for a better outcome. I oppose this regulation. Um, Can I speak to those? Yes, please. Okay. Uh, point one, uh, obviously the planning and zoning membership is also based on political party affiliations and doctrine. Uh, the Conservation Commission, like PNZ, is made up of citizen volunteers and is also answerable to the town of Monroe. <coughs> With regards to comment number two, 
The POCD is an inclusive tool involving all town stakeholders, including the Conservation Commission, which is an important entity in the preparation and implementation of the POCD. With regards to comment three, not all the applications that he mentions are actually applications before this commission. Some of those things, like community events, go simply to the zoning enforcement officer. Signs are all embedded within the bigger projects, projects that you see. And we don't consider applications to be bond releases and time extensions. Essentially, what gets submitted to conservation is the same thing that goes to ART, which is a special exception permit to site plans and subdivisions and the zone changes in the zone tax amendments. That's really what we're talking about here. Um, and obviously, the Conservation Commission is focused on what the statutory authority gives them. So they can't really go outside and a sign really isn't going to fall into that kind of that belly wick. Plus, I don't believe they have time for that because as it is, you see what you get already. With regards to number four, um, I, I, there is a copy of the statutory requirements which are governed by the town chapter in section 11 and the Connecticut state chapter section 7-131A, which gives the charge and what they're to be looking at and the focus that they're looking at. Um, with regards to five, um, comments from the Conservation Commission are not required by these amendments. It's simply the referral is required to these amendments. And they have to follow the timeline as we talked earlier. And if they don't, then their comments aren't going to be part of the record. Um, with regards to delay, I'm not sure I would use the word delay. With regards to wetlands, there are statutory requirements that a uh, wetland report is to is part of the process so an applicant's application would be incomplete with that it's not a delay if their application is incomplete um, <coughs> where was I? Uh, in any regard it's always up to the planning and zoning commission when to close a hearing or when it has sufficient information you're charged with that responsibility, regardless of whatever standard we are, we have, because your decision has to be based on a sound record that, that you collect. Um, and the obtaining of essential and important information, again, is not a delay, because you need what you need in order to make a decision. And that is the purpose of why you have 65 days in which to uh, review an application prior to a public hearing and is also why you have 35 days to have a public hearing, so that you have sufficient time to gather whatever information you all deem is necessary and important in that particular application. With regard to the last point, um, although you do have input from the Wetlands Commission and the Water Company, their focuses are maybe similar to some ideas in conservation, but they're also specific to their areas of statutory authority. They do not cover the same gamut in all so you know there is a important part that the conservation commission does look at that these agencies don't specifically look at and that's why there is the state statutes that give them that authority as well could you give some examples of that i just go a little further well the welland commission is looking at what's happening to the wetland specifically mm -hmm. Conservation can be much broader than just wetlands. It can look at forested areas, upland habitat, meadows that are not in wetland areas. Okay. And the water company obviously is looking at the protection of the water resource yeah. from a drinking point. Yeah, as Mr. Kornaska pointed out, they, they are the stewards of the open space in town. Yeah. So yeah, no, it's, not, it's helpful, not just yeah. wetlands. Yeah. You know, it's, mm -hmm. it's uh, conservation. Yeah. The broad in the broader sense. Does anybody have any other questions or concerns? I mean, my only thing is, do we want to consider? I, I I think this is something that we should have. I think it is a good idea to have input from the, the more information we have, the easier and better it's going to be for us to make decisions. Should we look at changing the language a little bit with regards to you know the all applications maybe? put in what Will said, special exception, he listed about three or four. Put that in there instead of all applications, make it be those specific ones. And then the only other thing, I think we're good with the tide. I don't think it's gonna delay. I think that's clear that- Well, no, there's, you know, there, there's, no, there's nothing here that says we have to get 
a report from them. Exactly. Yeah. So, so we have I, to we have yeah. to send it to them. Yeah. So that, I'm okay with then that. We fulfilled yeah. our application of mm -hmm. this regulation. But then my only other language thing would be to I guess it's his number four that Pat had put through the language <laughs> regarding what they can advise upon. Will had brought up you know that they have a specific scope. Should we have that in there under the advisory comments and recommendations? As deemed warranted, maybe it should be uh, within the scope of the uh, their charter or whatever that might be. Because I understand, I get where Pat could be coming from looking at this and thinking, oh, well, then what if they decide they want to send us a whole letter about something that's not related to conservation at all? Will it happen? No. But again, if it's not the same people in that com commission in a couple years, it could happen. And so then we I get them, that maybe just tweaking something. That's letter. outside of your purview. So yeah, well, of course, but it's still a letter that would then come in front of and you can this commission. And you can ignore it as irrelevant to the friendly, yeah. but even if you put that in, they still can send it. Yeah. Of course. I'm just wondering if you know, just those two, maybe some form of tweaking the language yeah, there. Yeah, in, in one we could if to you make want. the person complaining happy. Yeah. At the. <laughs> So we want to make SEP site plans? Yeah, we could do special accessible permit site plans, only bound changes, regulation changes, permit amendments. And number one, we could carry it in at the end consistent with town charter. Yeah, I think I think that that's just <coughs> two little tweaks, and I think this is okay. Fine Anything for else? Me. Anyone? Okay. Um, well, close your hearing. Yes, close your hearing. Close. Nine oh nine. Um, okay. There's no next, opposition to uh, the next one. <laughs> is there an opposition to the next one? I don't know. Does it come from down that end if there is? <laughs> Planning and Zoning Commission. Notice a public hearing can be held March 21st, 2019 in accordance with Connecticut General Statute 8-7D. A public hearing will be held in the Town Hall Council Chamber, 7 Fan Hill Road, Monroe, Connecticut, on Thursday, March 21st, 2019 at 7 p.m. or soon thereafter concerning the following. RAA 2019-03, file number 1004E, Zoning Regulation Text Amendments, Public Utility Facilities, Planning and Zoning Commission proposed Zoning Regulations Text Amendments, amending section 2.2.1 to define a public utility facility and incorporating said use in section 10.1, Schedule of Permitted Land Uses by Zoning District. What do we got, Will? Exhibit 1, draft zoning text amendment. Exhibit 2, uh, referral to Aquarium Water and TBH. Uh, uh, exhibit 3, referral to planning agencies. Exhibit 4, referral to adjacent municipalities. Exhibit 5, response from Westcock. Exhibit 6, green cards from notification to Aquarium and DPH. Exhibit 7, green cards from adjacent <coughs> municipality referrals. And Exhibit 8, response from NV COG. That is all. I will note for the record that the responses from both Westcog and NVCOG were both that this is a local matter determination. Um, we did not get any responses from anyone else. Um, this amendment, again, is proposed by the commission. Um, this is back in a, uh, a bit when we did some of those changes with the, with the use tables and stuff. This kind of fell out because it was somewhat tied also to this telecommunications industry which are exempt under uh, zoning but the uh, public utilities such as aquarium water is not exempt um, so this is really trying to restore something that was previously in the code and actually it's timely because aquarium is coming to you with an application in, in a meeting or two from now to do an improvement to one of their water tank facilities um, so basically what this is doing is the, the amendment includes a definition for a public utility facility that says any facility or structure erected by a public service company as that term is defined by Connecticut law unless the location of such is reg regulated by the Connecticut Siting Council. And the things that are regulated by the Siting Council are, are cell towers um, and power uh, substations and things like that. The other part of the amendment would be, and the part here is just for your information of the jurisdictional authority that will not be in the code that's just for information purposes the other amendment that would be in the code would be amending the schedule of uses 
um, to put the public utility facility to allow it as a special exception <coughs> from all the zones with the exception of the multifamily type zones where it would be an accessory use to that, um, that particular use. Uh, pretty simple. This has been reviewed by attorney Marino um, and he's, he has no issue with, with it according to my review with him. All right, so this is what we said is to put something back in that erroneously got taken out when we did the last big revision. Anybody have any questions? No, sir. So this doesn't apply to the cell tower, you said, right? That this sort of thing. No, we're it, it would apply to um, like a sewage pump station or potentially building, right? If we so, had such a thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah right. <laughs> <laughs> Bad example. <huh? laughs> For the most part, this is going to apply to Aquarian. Yeah. That ship has sailed. Okay. All right. Any, uh, anyone would like to speak in favor of this application? Anyone with questions or comments? All right. Back to you, Will. I think it's pretty simple, so I would suggest if you have no further questions or need for information, that you close the hearing. Close. 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 Hearings closed. Nine fourteen. That wraps up public hearings. What? Almost. Two hours. Um, item uh, site plan review and permit amendment modifications none deliberations and determinations number 12 time extensions we have none 13 bond releases and reductions none item number 14 pending meeting minutes for march 7 2019 so uh, we have porter o'reilly lisi ambrosi maini <coughs> Move to accept the uh, Planning and Zoning Commission minutes of March 7th, 2019 as pending. Second. We have a motion. We have a second. Any uh, discussion or corrections? No, sir. Hearing none, I'll call the roll. Main, yes. And Rosie, yes. Porter, yes. ACL, yes. Okay. Pending application deliberation determinations. Um, Okay, first up is RAA 2019-01, file number 1002E, the zoning regulation text amendment for the referral to the Conservation Commission. Um, we have one proposed change that will itemize the type of applications that will go to the Conservation Commission. Um, what else? That was it. That was it. We're not allowed to talk now, right? You want the reference? No, you're not. Yeah, you're not allowed yeah, to talk. Okay, you're staring you? at me. That's Shh. Fine. Did sorry. you also want the reference to the charter? I'm sorry? Did you also want the reference to the charter? To the state statute. two statutes. counties. Well, no, the, the charter will point to the state statute. Right. So at the end of one, consistent with the charter. That's um, the authority part? Yes, that, that's a good idea. Well, look at me for well, because you're at that end, and then we go, <laughs> we go this way. So, so if you have no other comments, then no other comments. All right, I'm good. No. good. No. All right, so then we that's close. We want to. We already we, closed. We it. already closed. Oh, that's we want to uh, reclose it. Ask staff <laughs> to do a, uh, a a positive referral. Positive referral. Yes. Yes. Positive approval. Positive, positive approval. approval. Yeah. Okay. Okay. You're getting so technical. Mm -hmm. All right, that brings us to RAA 2019-03, file number 1004E, Zoning Regulation Text Amendment for Public Utility Facilities. Positive approval. Leon? Yeah. Yep. Yes, Leon. Okay, by, by, yeah. by uh, overwhelming consensus of the commission, uh, we should do a <coughs> positive approval on that. Okay. And that's all we have for deliberations tonight. Um, other business, item number 16, regulation review amendment work session. 
Um, what do we have hanging? You guys need a break. Take it easy. Our thing is no. no. I don't think we have anything. We're just got to scroll in here specifically. Yeah. What's is next it? on our agenda for that? Um, when's the aquaturf thing? Next Thursday. Good job, Leah. We'll, yeah. we'll get to that. We'll get to that. I don't have anything that that was lingering specifically. You're my plus so one. I, nothing's coming because we've got everything advanced to hearing so far. So I just said. Yeah. So yeah, you want to pick on something that, that we wanted to Me and are definitely on the bring to the regulation show plan and just get the figure where anything that was hanging there. All right, then we're not going to schedule a meeting for next week. Okay. Um, okay. Correspondence, other received. Uh, nothing. Chairman's report. Don't forget next Thursday evening. Oh, the officer. Is the, uh, Thanks for reminding me. So I have Bruno, <coughs> Leon, Garcelle, Mike, right? Yes. And myself, that's it. Anyone else? The last chance? We've got to get the check printed. Did you join? I can't. No. Am I okay. No? A wild night with the state planning and zoning people? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I mean, that's going to be a blast. <laughs> you put it that way. <laughs> Open bar. Yeah. Is it uh, really? I think it's a cash bar. No, it's, kind of <laughs> <laughs> it's open, but you gotta get it. might be like open bar for us as long as you have money. So. Right. As long as your wallet's open. Mike, just put your credit card there. It's open bar. <laughs> well, Leon doesn't drink. He can be our designated driver. That's right. I can try those all. Yeah, my truck will fit everyone. <laughs> um, I don't drink at all, so. My All right, any everybody. commissioner's reports? No, sir. Staff reports? Okay, Ricks. Uh, no ZBA meeting for this month. The next meeting will be April 2nd. Uh, nothing from the Siding Council. Uh, regulation subcommittee uh, uh, has not met, nor will they meet next week. Zoning enforcement program, 31 Lorraine Drive. Work is in progress for the illegal contractor's yard. Voluntary compliance <coughs> percent to owner. 69 Osborne Lane, unregistered motor vehicles. That was resolved. 8688 Hiram Road. Use of accessory dwelling unit by non-qualified occupant. Owner contacted and work in progress. This is a single family dwelling that's not occupied by the owner. And there is a uh, accessory dwelling in it. So there are two separate families living in it. So it's a work in progress. Notice was sent out. 48 pastors walk unregistered motor vehicle. Uh, owner contacted and work in, in progress. Zoning citation program. There were no hearings scheduled for this reporting period. Planning matters. Uh, the POCD uh, update. The deadline for submission is coming up March 25th. The chairman and the full commission need to get involved in the selection, obviously. We've so gotten one so far. One? Yeah. One? Wow. Well, the deadline next week, so yeah. we have gotten I don't know. What's going to be the process? Those are all sealed bids, correct? Yeah. What's going to be the, the process or procedure for opening this? I'm sure it's not going to be a public opening. No, it's not going to be a public opening. So we need to know from you folks how you want to go forward with the selection. If you want to break that down to a committee, or do you want to, and then take it to the full commission, or air it as a full commission. Might be easier if we had at least an initial committee to go. What is this for? The POCD. The POCD. Thing. Selecting the uh, consultant. Consultant. Yeah. Well, I think you need a smaller commission, and then I I think so too, and I I. Not that I don't think that everyone's uh, opinion is valuable, but who has, has who's worked with the POCD before? I have. Michael, I have. Leon, I have. Have you? No. Anybody? Well, is it an RFQ or RFP? Is well, it it's, an R it's an RFP. It's an RFP that fees in it, it includes fees, but part of the structure is a. Uh, um, really to kind of get an understanding of who's a potential candidate and then work out a final scope and a final cost. That's part of the first phase of the 
what? Right. But then I'm saying it's just not qualifications. There are oh, yeah, there, there are, are fees. Fees. They, 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 were, they were given a, a rough scope yeah. and were told to provide a, a cost and, more importantly, provide what their qualifications mm -hmm. are. Why don't we, why don't we, I mean, since it's pretty much the regulation review committee, um, why don't we just use that subcommittee to um, do the initial review okay. before we, and then we'll just go to the full commission with them. I second that. I third it. And we do have it, I don't forget it, I don't have it right now, but it's about a month's time that I think we want to get into interviews, so. About how long to prepare it? A year, doesn't it? It it it's could it could take a year. Yeah. yeah. We have until the end of 2020 to have it in place, so we have plenty of time. Yeah, so yeah, that building. Building. yeah. Um, Well, everything's due in by next Monday. Yes. But we have a meeting on Thursday. We only have one application. Well, one submitted, but they'll come if they come. Most of them will come on the on the final day. Oh, really? Yeah. What's the deadline of that? Monday. Monday. Like in four days, Monday. Yeah. Yes. So you're gonna get a lot on like Monday. Probably. Probably. I, I would imagine. I would. Ex I'm surprised we have one already. Yeah, I was. Too. I thought they would all be here on Monday. Oh, really? Yeah. Well, yeah. well it does things last minute, you know. Well, well, then I get paid do to do it, so they, you know. They, they, plus, they, they don't want, they don't want you to be able to look at their proposal, oh, tell your friend, and then call your buddy over here who does <laughs> POCD reviews and <laughs> tell him what this guy is proposing. Right. So they all want to get him in at the last, last minute. minute. What's um, last minute though? It's like what? I think Close it's. Of I business. think it's three o'clock. Are you looking at the way? No, I was just oh. looking at the calendar. I think it's three o'clock Monday. It may, if not, it's 4.30. So somewhere Monday afternoon, they'll come in. That's so funny. Um, well, why don't we see what we get, and then we'll, we'll confer on a, a date to, uh, well, Thursday we're going to. We talk on well, we can talk about that. Yeah, we'll we talk, talk about, about that. Yeah. Work. Okay. And Bill, uh, you know, I attend all the other boards and commission meetings, and I'm reminding them of the, this upcoming exercise, and I'm going to provide copies of the current POCD so they're prepared. Okay, I'm sorry, I kind of cut you off there, Rick. Keep oh, no, going. that's uh, no special meetings of uh, March after tonight, and we're holding strong in one single family dwelling construction for the calendar year. One. Where? Uh, um, the one off of the 111. Um, <coughs> Bird's Eye? Yeah. Oh, open the new yeah. subdivision. The new subdivision is good. To sell. All right. Does anybody have Thank anything you. else? No, sir. Okay. Close meeting. Meeting adjourned. 926.